Are we live? Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, we have uh, today at 5 p.m. within the Belgian AI Week, the great honor to welcome Patty Mass. Uh, Patty, you are a professor at MIT. Um, and uh, until recently, you served as academic head of uh, the MIT Media Labs. Um, you radically reinvent the human machine experience with all uh, the research in MIT Media Lab. And uh, coming from a background in artificial intelligence and human computer interaction, you are particularly interested in the topic of cognitive enhancement and how immersive and wearable systems can actively assist people with memory, attention, learning, decision-making, communication, and well-being. Uh, you are also the editor of uh, uh, books, uh, editorial board member, and renewer for numerous professional journals and conferences. You have uh, received many awards. Uh, I can cite, I cannot cite them all, um, but uh, you, you finish your PhD at the Vrij Universiteit Brussels in Belgium. Um, um, and no, sorry, you received a, an honorary doctorate at the Vrij Universiteit Brussels in Belgium. And uh, now uh, you will discuss with us um, uh, your own research in extending human intelligence with smart machine and tell us a bit about. Uh, the MIT Media Lab uh, emphasizing, on, uh, emphasizing on collaboration with the industry, government, and academia uh, that is critical for creating a thriving environment for invention and innovation. So uh, you are uh, certainly the, the most famous uh, Belgian uh, abroad uh, in artificial intelligence. It's a real honor to welcome you today. Uh, Patti, you have the floor. Hi. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much, Nathaniel, for inviting me. So today I want to tell you a little bit more about my work on enhancing human cognition. But before I do so, I want to tell people and want to tell all of you a little bit more about the MIT Media Lab, uh, which is uh, the place where I am a professor. The MIT Media Lab works at the intersection of technology and people, technology and society. Our mission is to benefit society by inventing new technologies and new experiences that enable people to understand and transform their lives, communities and environments. The Media Lab, and I hope you're seeing my slides advance, let me know if not, is both a research lab and a graduate program. We have master's students and PhD students who work full time in our laboratory doing research and also uh, along the way getting their degrees. What is unique about the Media Laboratory is that we are highly interdisciplinary. We bring together artists, scientists, designers, engineers, psychologists, um, all sorts of people with all sorts of backgrounds to collaborate uh, with one another to really invent uh, the future and, and study how emerging technologies may change people's lives. Another way in which we are unique is that we work very closely with industry, with communities and with governments on real world problems. Most of our work is really um, inspired by real world problems. And again, we work closely with all of these partners in making sure that the technologies that we develop um, actually have real potential to ultimately be deployed. 
almost a third of our funding comes from industry. Um, we have uh, this uh, consortium, which uh, consists of member companies from all over the world that pay an annual fee to uh, to, that gives them access to our unique research. And uh, by doing so, they can have access to research directions that may be too risky or too costly for them to do inside of their own uh, company. So they work with us together um, on uh, sort of these, uh, looking at these emerging technologies and their potential. Our alums go on to careers in research and academia, as well as becoming entrepreneurs. On the left, for example, you see my former student Pranav Mistry, who is now a senior vice president for Samsung. And on the right, you see another one of our alums, Aya Bedir, who is the CEO and founder of her own company, Little Bits. Um, research and projects that are developed at the lab frequently grow out of the lab as either tech transfer to our member companies, the, the companies that fund us, or as spin-off companies. For example, here in the video, you see another um, spin-off from my research group uh, called Tulip, which is all about augmenting the manufacturing floor with sensor networks and um, AI that can basically analyze um, what is happening, where errors occur, um, can make predictions about uh, workflow and outputs and more. We have an affiliate early stage venture fund that helps the students and the faculty with starting companies. In fact, we highly encourage and make it easy for our graduate students and faculty to start companies. Our fund, the E14 fund, will basically fund any um, alum from our uh, program who has even just the beginnings of an idea and they will help that alum with um, developing the idea further and raising uh, initial seed funding and more. Uh, another example from my research group, one of my former students um, uh, came up with an idea to make ink for printers, for fabrics and so on, that is made from pollution by collecting pollution um, from trucks. And uh, in fact, uh, he won the best invention of the year uh, from Time magazine um, with um, his startup and his invention and was funded again by that early stage fund, the E14 fund. We also strive for other forms of real world impact. Not all of it is through companies and products. Um, some of our faculty do exhibitions or performances. For example, on the bottom left, you see Todd Macover, who is one of my colleagues and is actually a composer who uses new technologies um, in his operas and in his compositions. Um, some other faculty will create free tools. Um, for example, on the bottom right, you see my colleague Mitch Resnick, who created the programming language Scratch, which is made available for free on the web and has over 25 million uh, children worldwide using it uh, without any instruction to teach themselves programming. Uh, we also engage in advocacy, especially around the, uh, the ethics of emerging technologies. On the um, top left, you see um, one of our graduate students, uh, Joy Bulanwini, who is uh, one of the main advocates and main voices really uh, talking about and making people aware of the algorithmic bias that exists in uh, AI and machine learning technologies. So I hope that this little introduction um, gives you a little bit more of a sense of why the Media Lab is so successful. Of course, we do attract a lot of highly creative, entrepreneurial, smart students from all over the world. But we also have a formula that makes it easy for those students and for the faculty to be impactful and successful. 
Um, and our formula really consists of doing interdisciplinary research in close collaboration with industry, where we aim for real world impact in addition to academic success. And we encourage risk taking and entrepreneurship by our students and by our faculty and support them uh, in uh, the startups that they create. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about my own work at the Media Laboratory. I run one of the 22 research groups um, at the Media Laboratory, and my work is all about intelligence augmentation or cognitive enhancement. Um, I started out as an AI person uh, studying artificial intelligence at the VUB and later um, I uh, worked uh, for a while in AI also at MIT in another department. But I became gradually more interested in helping people be more intelligent and be, become more than what they are, rather than in uh, the problem of creating smarter machines and smarter computers. Today, what motivates me is that on the one hand, today's devices are laptops and desktops and, and uh, phones and smartwatches give us access to the world's information. However, they don't really help us with some of the other um, functions that are really critical for being successful. Things like self-development or improving our well-being and optimal performance. All of us want to grow and change in some ways. We want to develop healthier habits, improve our ability to focus, learn more effectively, become better communicators, be less controlled by our emotions, make more rational de decisions, or at other times be much more creative. So I've been asking this question for a while now, can we design digital systems that help us thrive, that help people thrive? Can wearable or mobile devices support cognitive skills such as attention and creativity, learning, decision making, and more? The approach that we take in my lab relies on advances in sensor technologies, artificial intelligence, and sensory stimulation as well. Typically, the systems that we build will sense in real time some aspects of uh, the person's state. Uh, physiological sensors are used, e uh, brain computer interfaces. Um, we use cameras, uh, audio, and more. And all that data that is collected is interpreted using AI techniques to decide how to, in real time, intervene and provide some information or some feedback to a person that may be helpful to them. And those interventions take the form of, uh, or take all sorts of forms, audio, visual, tactile, symbolic, olfactory, temperature, electrical stimulation, and more. And of course, the systems are closed loop. We can actually uh, monitor what the effect is of the real-time feedback or the real-time intervention that is issued. Does it change the sensors? Does it change what the user does, how the user feels, etc.? Um, so these systems can sometimes even learn by themselves how to become more effective at supporting the user. Let me give you some examples. Um, take, for example, the ability to sustain attention. We have been working for the last four years on a platform which uh, has multiple form factors, but most often we use the glasses form factor. Uh, and these glasses actually have built-in sensors for sensing brainwave activity as well as eye movements. They also have uh, built-in modalities for intervention, namely audio and haptics. And the way we built, uh, we use this system is that um, a person can wear these glasses and they uh, almost look like <laughs> regular, acceptable, uh, fashionable uh, glasses. Um, they're still a little bit uh, bigger, but we're working on that. 
but the person will wear those. And when they are wearing the device, we can sense these activities of their brain and their eyes. And that can tell us whether the person is attentive and what they are attending in some cases, what they are attending to. So for example, we um, did an experiment in a classroom where we gave people our glasses and um, a third of the people got feedback every time our AI algorithms noticed that the person was not being attentive. So they would actually get listen or hear a sound that would remind them to pay attention to the teacher who was giving a lecture um, in the front of the classroom. Another third um, actually got random feedback. They were wearing the system, but they got random feedback at different times during the lecture. And a third group uh, got no feedback at all. And after the one hour lecture, and we did this three times, you see the three graphs uh, on the right there. Um, after the one hour lecture, we would give people a quiz about what they had learned in the lecture. And what we noticed is that the people who got this biofeedback, who got uh, feedback from the system telling them, hey, pay attention, whenever their attention was drifting, as measured by the EEG and the EOG sensors, um, they scored the best on the quizzes about the material that was offered, while people who got random feedback still did better. They got feedback at different random moments. They still did better than the third group that got no feedback at all, and they scored uh, the lowest on the quizzes. We've also evaluated this system in a driving, uh, driving simulator to help uh, drivers who may be falling asleep behind the wheel and more. Another example, we've been working on uh, helping people with memorization and learning. We built one system called Nevermind, which makes use of augmented reality glasses to help a person with encoding new things in memory in such a way that they are more likely to recall the material later. Um, we took the uh, winners of the Super Bowl in the United States, American football, as uh, the facts that the person had to try to memorize. And, but what we did was we had one group that would just memorize the winners of the Super Bowl every year from 60, 1967 on, on paper, while another group used our augmented reality glasses and they would actually follow a path, physically walk along a path that they knew well, for example, from the subway station to their office in the media lab. And at different points along the way, we would visualize the winners of the, C the Super Bowl, the subsequent winners of the Super Bowl using augmented reality uh, for them. So. For example, when the person comes out of the train um, inside the subway station, they would see a virtual guy with lots of boxes to remind them that the first winner of the Super Bowl was the Green Bay Packers. So Packers, a guy with boxes. Then the person moves up, up the escalator and they would again see a guy with lots of boxes going up the escalator because the next year the Green Bay Packers won again. Then they come out of the subway station and they see a virtual jet parked right there uh, when they come out of the subway station because the next year the New York Jets won and so on and so on. And the person just travels um, basically from the train to their office at the media lab. I think we have a video here of uh, someone doing that. And while they do so, they see all these augmentations like the Miami Dolphins in um, the uh, elevator and more. And we did a test right after people had experienced this AR system. Um, the group that studied on paper did equally well as the group that used our system, the augmented reality system, which we called Nevermind. But already 24 hours later, the group that studied the list of winners on paper, they had forgotten 50% or more 
of uh, the winners, while our group was able to almost perfectly still recall uh, the list of winners of the Super Bowl, because all they had to do was mentally revisit their path that they know well from the subway to their office and remember what the odd things were that they were seeing along the way. Um, so this is one example how wearable devices can actually help people with um, memorization and with uh, in such a way that uh, the memorization task is a lot more efficient and uh, effective. Decision making. Um, more recently, we built a system uh, which consists of um, augmented reality glasses, but these are just audio based actually. So these glasses manufactured by Bose, one of the companies that we have been working with, um, have a built-in microphone and built-in speaker. And we used these glasses to help a person with decision-making, with evaluating statements that they hear. All of us are constantly hearing statements that may or may not be true, whether it's a politician on TV or an advertisement or somebody in a business meeting. And we thought, well, what if we help a person with more rational decision-making and evaluation of those statements by having an AI assistant that also listens to statements and that can give them real-time advice about whether a statement seems to be supported by evidence or not. So we did a whole study uh, where a person would listen to uh, different statements. And uh, in one condition, we don't have any intervention. In a second condition, an AI system also listens to the statement and gives feedback saying, the statement is supported by evidence or not. And in a third condition, the AI system also gives an explanation and says why the statement is supported. And what we learned is that if a, um, we put again a whole um, series of uh, human subjects through this experiment, and we learned that the people who were assisted by the real time AI system that gives explanations, they would uh, in a significant way change their opinions in terms of whether they think a statement is true or not um, and whether they think it is reasonable or not and even whether they would support a cause that is about that statement. Uh, so people in that condition altered their decision making based on the real time feedback from the system, while uh, that did not happen for the non explainable AI system. Creativity is another area that we've recently been working on. Uh, some of you may have heard of the Proteus effect. The Proteus effect uh, basically says that the way you see yourself and the stereotypes that you believe in influence um, how you behave. So if uh, you think, for example, that um, say uh, women are less creative than men and you are a woman, then it is possible that if you believe in that stereotype that then you behave in less creative ways. So we thought, well, could we actually using technology from um, filters, Snapchat filters, as well as deep fakes, could we alter the person's um, self-image on a screen and then see or, or verify or study whether that also changes their behavior? Um, so we actually, again, performed a study where we had people um, just look at themselves on the left there, or they saw a younger child version of themselves in the middle. And then on the right, they saw themselves as a more crazy inventor artist type. And we did a, a Zoom-based study with 21 experiments where we tested how creative people were when they saw themselves as themselves versus as a child or an inventor artist 
type. Uh, we had a whole protocol and different measures that are known from the literature to verify uh, the creativity of people. Uh, we would give them basically uh, a random object and ask them to think of alternative uses for that object. And same with a verb, um, ask for uh, nouns that you could associate uh, with that verb. These are standard um, tests that are used to test creativity in people. And what we noticed was that when people see themselves on Zoom as a child, or as an inventor type, they actually increase in creativity. They perform in more creative ways, likely because they think of children and um, inventors as being more creative than the average person. Last, uh, we also do a lot of work with helping people with learning communication skills. In one project, um, we actually use electrodermal activity as a sensor on the wrist. Um, electrodermal activity is, it measures how the skin momentarily becomes a better conductor of electricity when there's an external or an internal stimulus that is physiologically arousing. And um, we used this uh, sensor and, and gave it to two people basically, but we actually informed them of the electrodermal activity level of the other person, uh, because we wanted to see whether this could help a person with developing better communication skills and developing empathy. Uh, this is an application that is very important, for example, in uh, romantic couples or for doctor-patient um, relationships or also in workplace uh, teams. We did again a user study um, and we used romantic couples and we had them talk about a very sensitive conversation topic. And the results by giving that feedback to the other person's telling the other person in a conversation when one individual is um, excited or when, when their EDA basically indicates that uh, they are um, more alert or more stimulated. And this can be because of positive as well as negative reasons. So when that happened, we gave a notification to the companion and what we noticed is that the people that engaged in these conversations, they increased the number of perceptual words that they used, things like feel, see, hear. They asked more questions when there was an EDA spike that they were notified about. They would ask questions like, why, um, why do you respond this way or tell me more about how this makes you feel and so on. They also use more uh, words like we versus I and they use more social words. All of these results indicating that people were being much more sensitive conversation partners and were showing more empathy for their conversation partner when they were given this um, sensory feedback. So I hope that these examples uh, demonstrate how devices can help us with personal growth and with uh, optimal performance. By using sensor data and AI techniques, we can in real time support cognitive skills that are incredibly important for people to be successful in life. Things like um, creativity, attention, memory and learning, communication, um, rational thinking, behavior change, uh, and more. We are very uh, aware that uh, there are major ethics issues that we have to be mindful of when we design these novel types of applications. These applications of wearables are very exciting, but they are also potentially, uh, they could also potentially have very negative uh, consequences because 
we are gathering a lot of very private data from people and then influencing people's behavior in uh, certain ways in real time. So we try to be extremely mindful of the ethics um, of this work. We design with target users. Um, we try to enable people rather than enforcing them. We try to give them new tools to help themselves if they desire to change in a particular in a particular way we try to teach them skills rather than making them dependent on the technology and last we always strive for keeping data private and local when that is um, uh, possible thank you very much and i'll be happy to answer some questions now Thank you very much, Patty. Um, so the, the first question we have is from Olaf Witowski. Do you know Olaf? Uh, because I discovered him uh, last week. Uh, he's the director of the Cognitive Science Department uh, in Tokyo University, and he's also Belgian. So we will, oh. we will try to find a, a slot for him before the, the end of the week. So it's a general question, but uh, the idea is, what is your working definition of intelligence? Uh, oh. <laughs> well, very good question. And I don't necessarily have an answer uh, for that. Um, uh, people in AI often joke that as soon as you uh, know how to replicate some phenomenon in a machine, then it's no longer intelligence. <laughs> so intelligence is whatever is sort of the next uh, uh, or just not reachable uh, for us. But um, I'm interested again in uh, not so much making smart machines, but rather helping people with function op uh, functioning optimally in life. And that takes more than just intelligence as, uh, say, IQ or ability to solve problems. It really takes a lot more things like motivation, creativity, attention, uh, communication skills and so on. So I think we need to broaden sort of uh, what we look at in terms of intelligence. It's not just coming up with the right answer for a particular problem. Yes, and uh, you, you told us about ethics uh, and, and you know that in Europe, there is much focus on that. Uh, and uh, Europe is, uh, uh, trying to, to, to find a way to position itself in, in, in between the United States and China. Uh, how, how do you, what is your vision on, on the discussion we have in, in Europe? Mm -hmm. And, and wh what do you do concretely in the United States uh, regarding these questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, very good question. Um, I think that Europe is much further ahead when it comes to um, thinking carefully about the ethical considerations of all these emerging technologies. And uh, for example, in the area of privacy of personal data, um, Europe is much more advanced and has stricter laws than uh, the United States. Um, in the United States, um, the industry uh, folks have tried to convince the government that they can self-regulate and that um, the government doesn't necessarily have to come up with um, strict rules and laws and so on. But uh, we have seen over and over that that results in um, in problems and, and or that that is a, not a perfect solution. So I think uh, the US is really behind in its thinking there uh, as compared to Europe. In China, which you mentioned as well, um, we have yet another situation because there it is really the government <laughs> that, yeah. uh, that is uh, collecting a lot of data on individuals and um, that uh, the government is not interested in supporting uh, privacy and, and uh, uh, respecting individuals' rights. So we have re really three very different um, situations. Yeah. yeah, but the fact is that Europe must, okay, now invest more and, and develop more uh, in artificial intelligence. 
So um, what do you think we are, we are maybe missing um, compared to the United States and, 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 and China? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that um, it, Europe is actually investing in research and, and uh, some of the European governments. But I think one, one issue that doesn't work as well in Europe as in the United States is this collaboration between industry and academia. It seems that in Europe, we don't really have this same tradition of universities working with closely with industry and um, in, in developing new technologies. And I think that is one area that could be strengthened a lot in Europe actually. And then also the link between um, venture capital and entrepreneurship and academic research. Uh, here at MIT, I mentioned our own fund at, um, at the Media Lab, the E14 fund, but right around the MIT campus, there must be at least 25 venture capital funds that are literally at the border of the MIT campus. <laughs> they come to the events, they sit in the, the talks and lectures, they go to all the social um, events that happen to get to know potential entrepreneurs. So there is a, a close collaboration there between that whole entrepreneurial community and uh, the academic community. And I think that that is not quite happening at the same level um, in Europe either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a question from Bruno Dumas uh, from Université de Namur, if I not wrong. Um, multiple instances of your work involve wearables and devices that capture, there is so much question, I cannot read it. Um, uh, rather, um, your work involves wearables and devices that capture rather intimate and or physiologi physiological data. How did user react during these studies? And it's also interesting because we will welcome uh, Anu Kuiprecht on Thursday. Uh, do you know our work on, mm -hmm. on smart clothes and so? Mm -hmm. So it will be related. So mm -hmm. is there a specific, uh, uh, specific reaction or on, mm -hmm. on the interaction between human and, and, and these technologies? But mm -hmm. Yeah, so indeed, um, the systems that we built collect a lot of very personal data, uh, physiological data, even brain data, uh, behavioral data, and more. Um, so that systems can then help the person in the moment with all of these uh, topics that I talked about. Um, we, I have to say that first of all, in all of our experiments, and I'm sure uh, that is the same in Europe as well, we have uh, a board at MIT that makes sure that the experiments are performed in a way that protects uh, people's privacy and so on, that the data are stored on encrypted servers and so on. Um, but um, I think people have over and over, if we look at uh, sort of the devices and the technologies that we use every day, people have over and over given up some uh, data, personal data, to get value. Uh, people are interested in doing so. What we have to make sure is that the data is belongs to the user and that ideally the data even gets processed locally so that nobody else can have access to it. Um, for example, the um, device that I showed in the beginning, the glasses that collect the brainwave data and the uh, eye gaze data, we actually yeah. have everything running locally. So those glasses can run without being connected via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi to a network. Um, and that is our vision for these systems that if it is possible, we do the processing of the data locally so that we never even have to give the data out uh, to third parties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really important, I think. Mm -hmm. um, there is a question here about, okay, uh, if we announce uh, the human capabilities with the devices uh, you have shown, uh, 
do you work also on the improvement on the own um, uh, capabilities of the human? I mean, without the device, uh, will you learn uh, something yeah. or improve the performance uh, permanently? It's a question from Luca Lefiska. Yes, great question. Um, I try to convey that in one of my four uh, ethics points. Basically, whenever possible, we try to train people or teach people rather how to develop a certain skill in the hope that they can get rid of the, the device after that they no longer need the device. Um, so our goal is always to develop certain skills basically with the help of the device, but at some point, hopefully, uh, the person no longer needs the device and can uh, has developed that skill and internalized that skill. So yes, that's um, we we always strive for that if that is possible. In other cases, though, it may not be possible. A lot of our work, I didn't emphasize that today, but we often work um, with people that have lost certain skills, yeah. for example, ALS or MS patients who can no longer uh, communicate and so on. So in those cases, they, they will rely on the device um, going forward uh, to, be, to give them a certain skill. Um, but for other people, whenever possible, we try to ultimately uh, make the device, make itself obsolete. Yeah. yeah. And um, do, do you see a risk in standardization? Uh, what do you think about uh, Elon Musk's uh, work, for example, in introducing some additional capacities in the brain? And mm -hmm. uh, is there a risk that uh, everyone must have at least the same level of computational mm -hmm. power, let's say, and that we, we go rather through standardization and, mm -hmm. and we lose yeah. uh, with this approach, we lose uh, creativity, diversity, and maybe collective intelligence. So yeah. there are different questions in, in my question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think... Um, yeah, there is a risk sort of of the haves and the have nots and that everybody ultimately has to then develop the, the same skills uh, to be able to be at the same level, maybe as other people. Um, I, I agree. Um, that is true for all technologies, though. I think people, what is unique about people is that we reinvent ourselves. Um, we invent new technologies that change us and that change how we live and that change what is possible and how we spend our time and what it is that we do versus what we uh, delegate and rely on technologies uh, for. Um, so I think that is the nature of being human, that um, we ever change things. And indeed, you could argue are we making our lives better by always <laughs> inventing uh, maybe faster means of uh, uh, transportation or better ways of uh, 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 working with more data and information and so on? Um, I think that's a bigger question, uh, not just for the work that I'm doing, but really for all of um, science and uh, innovation, ultimately. Yeah. yeah, and my question is, maybe the second part is really, do we have to focus on the enhancement of the individual or on collective intelligence and, mm -hmm. and, and bring the value from the diversity? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the Media Lab itself shows the importance of diversity. Yeah. I mentioned it in the beginning. When I first came to the Media Lab, I, I actually spent one year working in the AI laboratory at MIT and then moved to the Media Laboratory. And I thought, what, what a strange environment is this? We have musicians and we have movie makers and we have artists. Our, I mean, is this serious? <laughs> but I realized that by bringing these people in uh, or all together sort of that think in very different ways and that work in very different ways 
that that is actually one of the secrets of the Media Lab success. So I am very much in favor of more diversity being mm-hmm. better. All I want to do with uh, the work that we do is give people tools if they want to change, if they want to say be able to be more attentive uh, in the moment, then they can use the glasses. But if they um, uh, don't want that, then they don't have to use them. Or in other moments, they don't have to use them. I think the the fact that there is a um, I think seven billion dollar industry for self help books and mm-hmm. videos and courses and that so many people have therapists and coaches and so on it shows that there is a need uh, or that people aren't always happy with themselves and that they want to change some of the ways they they function so what we're trying to do with our work is give them another tool apart from the tools that they already have access to, like reading a book, watching a video, going to a therapist or a coach, or even taking medicine to be more attentive or um, more creative and more, you know. I have a question here related to the, 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 the time of learning. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we, we, we speed up, we accelerate, uh, it's felt like that. And sometimes slow learning may have a long-term advantage. Um, I don't know. I, I just I think the question of the time is always interesting. Um, mm. Is it in, an inspiring question to you? It's from Johnny Deng. Mm. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm. I'm not sure what the the question is, but um, yeah, I think part of I think some of the questions are getting at what future do we want, <laughs> and where is this all going? Because we're we're all developing uh, technology and uh, that is more and more capable and gives us more and more. Uh, abilities but where does it end and what do we value and um, and so on and I don't necessarily have the the right answer about this I think everybody also has to make those decisions for themselves again my goal is to give individuals another tool that they can use if they want to change but I don't want to force them to change or set a different standard Do you see EEG-based and BCI devices going beyond the monitoring of mental state? Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, could you synthesize uh, natural speech from EEG? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, it's okay. a question from Bob Bandes. So there are mm-hmm. already many works. Uh, but I... Yeah, so BCI's... Brain computer interfaces are really uh, an area that is growing rapidly in yeah. importance. You mentioned Elon Musk's uh, Neuralink uh, work previously, although that is invasive. <laughs> But even the non-invasive EEG and uh, other uh, others, FNIRs, and there's some other things that are uh, other technologies that are being looked at as well. Um, Uh, it's an increasingly important area um, to date or till fairly recently EEG uh, caps and uh, were very expensive and um, it's only as of recently that they have uh, become available in cheaper uh, packages and and also in in ways where you have access to the raw data um, there's uh, uh, efforts like open bci for example which makes uh, uh, open source technologies for brain computer interfaces uh, for the research community at a cheap uh, price point and um, Uh, uh, every day there's interesting new applications and new studies that people are performing with these technologies. So it's definitely an area to, uh, to keep an eye on. Um, Christine Kopers is asking, uh, you, you have been involved in the creation and the, the uh, incorporation of many startups uh, and pri- private companies. Are, are you able to 
to to follow what they do with with the research. Uh, yeah. And- so indeed, there's been many, probably a third of my students end up starting companies. <laughs> and often they get me involved as well in some capacity, although usually that's at a, uh, more at an advisory, in an advisory role. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'm not really closely involved uh, with any of them, but it's uh, really um, gratifying, I think, to see that there are real companies, uh, uh, real world applications coming out of the technology, not just uh, scientific publications. Yeah. Um, okay, Tom Lennart um, asks, uh, should university programs in Belgium be adapted to the Media Lab format? I have my IV, but uh, you, you have been at the UB um, and, and you did your PhD there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. So I was not wrong, but uh, you, yeah, you yeah. have also an honorary doctorate there. Mm-hmm. So um, do you think uh, Europe must do as the media, MIT Media Lab does? <laughs> because <laughs> well, you I, have, I, I have a surprise for you. Uh, François Tadei was, uh, was, um, mm. was intending to join us, but it's not possible. So, yeah. uh, and maybe the CRI is a bit yes, like, a uh, like like the, the media lab. So, yes. So maybe... Yeah, I'm not saying that our model is better, <laughs> but <laughs> I did want to explain in the beginning of my talk a little bit what is different about yeah. um, the media lab. And, and of course, my idea of what universities in Belgium are doing these days may be wrong because I've been gone for 30 years. <laughs> but um, I think there's, yeah, at MIT especially, there's a lot more emphasis on research, not just on teaching. Um, I mentioned that the people who do all this work that I uh, showed you today are the master's students and the PhD students. They take some classes, but the the emphasis is really not so much on taking courses. And in fact, they have complete freedom as to which courses they they take. They can, and so they can pick courses that they are interested in because of their research. In Belgium, it seems that uh, at uh, um, even at the master's level, it's very predetermined what you have to study. You you have not much choice. Um, And so then you don't find um, or you don't give give people as many opportunities to bring very different things together and discover something new. Um, I have had, uh, say, computer scientists who study sleep and take classes on sleep because they want to come up with new devices that we use during sleep time. Um, Others may do something completely different. So I think having, um, yeah, giving the, the grad students a little bit more freedom in terms of the classes they pick and making research a bigger part of um, what they do at the university. Our master's students, they work at uh, for eight or 10 hours a day, <laughs> probably seven days a week <laughs> at the university uh, doing their research. Um, and, and research is the main component of what they do. And often they can do something amazing in their research that then opens all the doors for them so that they can uh, go work uh, wherever they want to work or start a company if that is what they want to do. Um, so yeah, it, I, I would personally love to see more of that um, yeah. happening. Would you say now. that there is a, a much more maker's approach? Uh, yes. In, yeah, that, that is key. Definitely. But uh, related to the funding, uh, I had in mind that uh, for the MIT Media Lab is really original because there are many companies funding it but it is not um, it, it's it is not dedicated research. They, they exactly. cannot decide. They can invest, but they cannot decide uh, exactly. where the, the direction of the research. Yeah. And and they can maybe uh, propose some specific um, research or applied research mm-hmm. project. But after having invest in the media lab project, no, is it yes, right? Yes, indeed, have, and that's. Level. Very important. So yeah. thank you for bringing that up. 
indeed all the companies that um, are members of the Media Lab Consortium, they cannot tell us what to do, basically. <laughs> they cannot tell us which research to do. They come and visit all the time. Every day we have at least five companies, not during COVID, but pre-COVID, uh, uh, visiting the Media Lab in person. And of course, they will tell us what some of the issues are and so on that they deal with. So some of um, their view on the world may inspire us, but they cannot tell us or, or they do not tell us what to work on. Um, they invest in the Media Lab as a whole uh, they get access to the whole media lab by becoming a member company. And um, we hope to inspire them with our work. They inspire yeah. us with their views of the what some critical problems are. Um, but it's a collaboration where um, we hope it's a win-win or we think it's a win-win, but they don't direct the work. Yeah. And if I remember right, they, they have a, a first refusal right, but non-exclusive. On yes. the IP that is generated. Yes, that is exactly. also an original model. Yes. Yeah. yeah so they can say, okay, I'm interested in that, but if mm -hmm. another member of uh, the fundings uh, yeah. uh, say it, okay, there is no exclusivity between them. Yeah. Yes, indeed. All the member companies have access uh, to license the, or rights to license our research pretty much for free. And that's the big benefit uh, or one big benefit that they get out of membership, in addition to just being exposed to <laughs> all these ideas and, and views of where the, the world is going. Yeah. And do you have uh, facilities or collaboration like in Berkeley with Intel, uh, yeah, common joint labs? Uh, where uh, some companies are on the campus and, and yeah. uh, provide engineers, for example, and the students can collaborate with them. Uh, do you have yeah. also that kind of facilities? Yeah, so, so I talked about the general membership model, yeah. which is a certain level, but companies can actually give more money to embed a researcher in our university research lab. So we have researchers... Um, from many different companies who basically um, reside in the media lab and are embedded in the research groups. For example, I have one from NTT, NTT Data yeah. in my group who works on projects with us. And of course, that um, means that given that, that that person is an engineer doing the actual work with us, uh, knowledge transfer is not a problem because uh, he is embedded in the project, but he is uh, working for NTT. Yeah. Patty, there, there is so much question, but um, <laughs> I think we, we are coming to, to the end. Um, we'll maybe uh, record all the questions and, and share it with you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, the Belgian AI Week, let's say it's a, a first attempt, but uh, for the two first day, we, we can say it's a, it's a success and we are doing something. So maybe position Belgium in the lead to, mm -hmm. to have really something out of Europe. We have many, many good points to, to, to value and um, and thank you for being there. So we have identified some, some people in the diaspora and I think it's really inspiring for the ecosystem uh, that uh, you, you are there today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nathaniel. It's really wonderful to see all of this activity happening in Belgium and Belgium taking a leadership uh, role in, in uh, uh, AI in Europe, yeah. Okay.